Well, it's great to welcome you back as we are continuing our studies of New Testament Greek. We're coming on this occasion to chapter 17, which actually officially marks being halfway through this book. So congratulations on your ongoing progress. We're coming at this point to the third declension. We've, of course, looked at the first two declensions. The second declension was the first one we encountered. That's sometimes called the Omicron declension. It's the easiest to master, and generally speaking, the nouns that we find in the second declension are masculine nouns, although that's certainly not always the case. Then we looked at the first declension, sometimes called the Alpha declension, mostly feminine nouns, but again, that's not always the case, and so we just need to learn the nouns on a case-by-case -case basis as we go along with that general rule applying in most cases. We've postponed treating the third declension until now for a couple of reasons. One is that there's not so many nouns in the New Testament that are in the third declension, so that's part of the reason, but there's enough that it's certainly worth knowing this declension and being comfortable with it. The other reason that it's introduced at this moment is because in chapter 18, the next chapter coming up, we're going to be looking at participles. And participles, as it turns out, make use of the third declension endings in many cases. And so, in order to be comfortable with learning participles, it's helpful to already have gotten some sense of the endings that are used in the third declension. Participles are complicated enough that you want to at least uh, simplify your life to some degree by being fairly uh, comfortable with working with these endings. So I'm going to encourage you to focus on this chapter, make sure that you get to the point that this seems fairly straightforward for you, and then as we move on to participles, you'll find that's one less thing to have to worry about as you're proceeding in your studies. So this is the third declension, not all that tough, but it is a little bit different in terms of the way that the nouns are formed, and so we're going to be giving a little bit of attention to that. I'll spend some time on the vocabulary list as we typically do, and then we'll do some exercises. I'll leave it to you to work through the rest of them, and once you feel real comfortable with this, then feel free to proceed to the next chapter. So let's, uh, let's take a look at these vocabulary words. The first of our words is the word hagios, hagia, hagion. Hagios is the word that means holy. If it's a feminine object, it'll use the alpha ending, and if it's neuter, it'll use the, some form of the neuter ending. Hagios is, of course, as you can imagine, quite common in the New Testament because the word holy is used very, very often. Certainly the reference to the Holy Spirit will make use of this word. The uh, plural of this in the nominative, hagioi, will sometimes be the word used for saints. In fact, whenever you see the word saints in the New Testament, this is the word that's going to stand behind it. So literally, saints means holy ones. Uh, if it's a feminine object, then of course it's going to be uh, the alpha ending. For example, if we ran into the phrase uh, the Holy Church, Ecclesia Hagia, then that would be the term we'd use. If it's a holy thing, then of course it'd be some form of the neuter ending there. The next word we have is hyma, hymatos. Notice that in the third declension you are provided both the nominative and the genitive singular. The reason you're provided the genitive singular is because you need that form of the noun in order to know how the rest of the declension will proceed. The nominative is sometimes a little bit irregular, and so the way to learn this is simply the combination hyma, hymatos, and uh, remembering that it's neuter. I'll just mention to you that every third declension noun that ends in mu alpha is neuter. We'll see some more even in this vocabulary list that illustrate that point. Hyma is, of course, the word from which we get the word hema, hematology, hematoma, words like that that are used in the medical profession, commonly refer to blood. And, of course, the word hyma is the word for blood. And so we run into this in the New Testament. Obviously, we find many references to blood, the blood of Christ, and so on. And so all of this is uh, important to master because this word shows up so frequently. The next word we have is the word ion, ionos. It's the word for age. You may have studied a little bit of history of Christian doctrine and heard of the Gnostic teaching about ion, uh, ages or emanations. Uh, that's not the sense, of course, in which it's used in the New Testament, but it may be a connection you can make at this point. But the word is translated age. It's used in that sense on many occasions. There is a kind of idiomatic use of the word. 
For example, if you see, and you can look in Machen's text here to find this, ace ton Iona, then that would literally be into the age, but it's idiomatically translated forever. On the other hand, if you see ace tus Ionas, ton Ionon, into the ages of the ages, that's going to be idiomatically translated forever and ever. So the word, of course, is used in a variety of occasions in the New Testament, and that's the basic meaning of it. Archon, archontos, and you have the genitive singular provided for you here, means a ruler. We've already had the word archo, I rule, and archomai, I begin. We uh, are not surprised, therefore, that the word noun form of that word, archon, means a ruler. If you've studied anything about ancient Greek history, you know that Athens was at one time ruled by a college of men known as the archons, the rulers. And so that was simply this word being applied to the office of political leadership in the city of Athens. Gramma means letter, grammatos, uh, the genitive singular of this. We have all kinds of words, of course, in English that use that particular uh, root. Uh, telegram would be a good example, and certain others you can uh, uh, think of them, grammar, that idea. All of these simply have to do with uh, letter, the uh, letters of the alphabet, other terms that would make use of that particular term. So that's very common in the New Testament. Uh, notice again that it's a mu alpha uh, term, and therefore it is neuter, as are all third declension nouns that end in mu alpha. Next we have the word elpis, elpidos. Elpis means hope. Elpidos is the genitive singular. It's a feminine noun. It's used, of course, very commonly, as you can imagine, in the New Testament. It means hope. And uh, so all of those times when we hear about hope in the New Testament, faith, hope, and love, and so on, all of these make use of this word. I'm not aware of any English word that derives directly from this, so this is one you'll simply have to memorize, but it shows up so frequently, I don't think you'll have any trouble doing so. The next word is the word thelema, thelematos. Thelema is the word for will. Notice that the longer ending here requires that we move the acute accent to the penult, which is what takes place here. It becomes the antepenult in this particular form of the word because, of course, you can't accent the syllable preceding the antepenult. This word means will. If you've studied any history of Christian theology, you know that at one point, way back when, there was something called the monothelite controversy. That was a heresy that taught that Jesus only had one will that was rejected by the church which substituted the view that Christ had two wills. Well, monothelite literally means one will, and it took its name from this particular uh, Greek word. The next word is the word nux. Nux and nuktos means night. You know the word nocturnal, and that comes from this Greek word. Nuktos is the genitive singular. It's feminine. And so beyond that, you just need to learn that word. It means night. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. That would be the word that was used there. Onema, onomatos, means name. Our word name in A-M-E comes from this Greek word, noma, uh, onema, and onomatos. Uh, nominalism, that philosophy of name, is uh, also from this particular word. And so that should make it uh, fairly easy to remember. And it's used, of course, commonly in the New Testament simply to refer to a person's name. Numa, pneumatos, is the word for spirit. You probably already knew that. It also can mean wind. It can also mean breath. If you've studied in a Hebrew, you know that there's a similar... There's also a word ruah, which can also have those three meanings. The meaning of uh, wind, breath, or spirit. In the New Testament, we find this word, of course, used very, very frequently. The Holy Spirit, of course, is uh, this particular word, and the human spirit, other forms of the word, are used uh, to convey that idea. The, uh, the, the word uh, pneuma is uh, used by Jesus in a kind of pun, you may recall, in John chapter 3, when he says to Nicodemus that the pneuma blows where it wants, 
You hear the sound thereof, but can't tell whence it comes and whither it goes. So is everyone who is born of the pneuma. And that play on words is, is bouncing between the notion of wind and the notion of spirit, as you know. Uh, here, rhema is the word for word, and rhematos, the genitive singular. We've already had the word logos. There's a distinction between these two. Logos is a word that has a more philosophical and technical character to it. As we've mentioned before, the word logos was actually used commonly in Greek tradition to stand for a rationality principle. That idea goes all the way back to the Greek pre-Socratic philosopher Heraclitus, and we find it used down through the history of Greek thought. Rhema is more the generic word for word. When you're just talking about common words that don't have any particular deep significance, it'd be more likely you'd use the word rhema. I don't want to overstate that too much, though, because you will, in the, fa in the New Testament, find both words used in a significant way, but as a general tendency, logos is used more in a kind of philosophical sense. Certainly, it's the word that's used to refer to Christ as the word, uh, whereas rhema is more the kind of generic and broad sense. Sarx, sarkos, is the word for flesh. You may know that the word sarcophagus literally means something that eats the flesh. It's from two Greek words, sarx, and the word phagomai, which means to eat. And so sarcophagus, it eats the flesh, kind of a macabre idea, but nevertheless that's the derivation of that word. Sarx is the word for flesh that's used in distinction to the pneuma, the spirit. The flesh wars against the spirit, Paul teaches us in Galatians. Uh, we also hear in Romans chapter 8 of a conflict between flesh and spirit. This is the word commonly used to convey that idea. And finally we have the word soma, somatos. Soma means body. Not the same as flesh. In the New Testament, flesh can refer to the physical body, but very commonly refers more to a moral principle or it refers to our fundamental humanity and so on, whereas soma more typically refers actually to the physical body. If you've ever read Brave New World, then you know that <clears throat> the word soma is used there in a very interesting way, and that is clearly an allusion to this Greek word somatos, which means body. All right, just a word about how these third declension nouns are declined. There's three different forms that Machen provides for you, and you'll notice these in the first page of this chapter. The easiest of them is, the, is found in the form of the word elpis. Notice that the accent here is on the second syllable, elpis. It would be the ultima, but of course when we come to the genitive singular, we add a syllable, elpidos. And so that turns this syllable into, in this case, the penult. The retentive rule ordinarily says that we leave the accent where we found it, and in this particular case that's exactly what you'll see happens. All the way through, the accent remains on the same syllable, even though the syllable itself uh, may become something besides the ultima. So it's the ultima here, the penult here, the penult here, and so on all the way down, but the accent wants to stay where you found it. As a general rule, in the third declension, when the ultima is accented in a two or more syllable word, then that's what you're going to find. The accent will remain where you found it, and that's e the easiest, then, of the various ways in which the rules of accent apply in the third declension. Now let's add this second column, as Machen does, and notice here we have a similar situation. We have the accent landing on the ultima. The difference is that elpis is a two-syllable word, whereas nux is a one-syllable word. So this gives rise to a separate rule that applies in the third declension. It's simply this, that when you have a one-syllable third declension noun, then in the genitive and the dative of both the singular and the plural, the accent is going to shift to the ultima. So it's nux, nuctos, nucti, nucta, nux. Nuctes, nuctone, nuxin, and nuctas. Don't ask me why. These are not uh, questions that I can answer, but this is simply one of the features of the third declension that makes it a little bit more tricky. So ordinarily the retentive rule applies, but there's an exception in the case of a one-syllable third declension noun, the same 
principle would apply to the one-syllable word sarks. And so those two words in particular you want to remember in connection with this particular little uh, um, feature. Let's add the third column now, which becomes a, a third alternative, and this really does pretty much cover the waterfront. This would be a third declension noun of more than one syllable, where the accent doesn't land on the uh, ultima, but lands on the, in this case, penult. And the general rule is that in third declension nouns that follow this form, well, again, the retentive rule is going to apply. So you'll notice that the accent remains all the way through on the uh, first syllable, with the exception of the genitive plural, where we have this long ultima, and that forces the accent over to the penult. So otherwise, with the exception of that one word, you're going to find that the uh, accent remains uh, where we found it. Now the other thing to notice here is how the dative plural in each case changes its form a bit. We have elpidon, lpc here, nugzi here, arcusin here. And this little strange change where we find the sigma showing up is explained by Machen in the chapter, and you might want to take a look at that, but for my money, I think it's easier just to remember it, just to make a little note that the dative plural in the third declension does incorporate the sigma and looks a little bit different, and I think it's just as easy to kind of memorize these for each noun as you go along. You'll begin noticing a kind of rule or principle that applies in each case, but that's probably the easiest way to deal with it. It has to do with certain uh, vowels that are contracted along the way, but I, I don't want to try to get into too much detail on that yet. So just uh, make a note of that, learn it, and I, again, you'll find it's not too tough to master, but it is a somewhat unexpected aspect of the third declension. All right, one more note before we look at the exercises. This word onema, onomatos, onomati, this is the word for name, as you know. The thing to notice about it is that it ends in mu alpha. And these particular third declension nouns that end in mu alpha are a little bit different from the others. And the thing that you want to notice about them is simply that we really only have the uh, nominative, genitive, and dative. The accusative and vocative are all identical to the nominative, and so it in some ways is a little bit easier. So we have uh, the retentive rule applying here. It's, it, it moves the accent to the uh, uh, antepenult here. Same thing here. Uh, same thing here. Of course, the long ultima requires that the accent land on the penult here. And then this short ultima puts it back here where we found it. So the retentive rule is basically applying in the way that we would expect. And the accent kind of moves around depending on the overall length of the word. The endings are otherwise similar to what we've already seen, and it's a little simpler because, as you can see, the uh, accusative and vocative are identical to the nominative all the way through. As noted already, all of these mu alpha nouns in the third declension are neuter, and so the form that you're seeing right here would apply generally to any neuter third declension nouns. All right, let's look at the exercises. This, this is the first one from the uh, Machen text, the translation exercise. Elpida uk ekusin uda to pneuma to hagion. So I recognize this word is hope, elpida, and I notice as well that it appears to be in the accusative. So I'm going to keep that in mind. It's probably a direct object here. Uk ekusin, they do not have, this is easy, we had this in the very first vocabulary list, they do not have elpida hope, uda, nor, to pneuma, the spirit, to hagion, the holy. Notice that pneuma is neuter, and thus hagion is neuter to agree with spirit. So even though we think of the Holy Spirit as personal in the New Testament and refer to the Holy Spirit with the personal pronoun he. Nevertheless, the actual Greek here is a neuter word, and so the Holy Spirit here is uh, kept in the neuter gender. So, they do not have hope nor the Holy Spirit.
would be the sense of that one. Number two, dia with the accusative is on account of, on account of, tain elpida, the hope, tain kalein, the good, feminine, adjective, to agree with the feminine, noun, elpida, so on account of the good hope, the disciples, in the nominative here, the subject of the sentence, enegkan, from Pharaoh, brought, Tauta these things. To Kiriu, I left out, the disciples of the Lord brought these things. So, putting it together, on account of the good hope, the Lord's disciples brought these things. And the third of the translation exercises Tauta esten ta remata to Hagiu numatos. These or these things, then I notice that this is a singular verb, these is. That doesn't make good English, but you remember that a neuter plural subject in Greek can take the singular verb, and that's what Machen is offering to us here. So we would translate it, these are. Notice also that a two-syllable enclitic following a word with the circumflex on the penult adds an acute accent on the ultima, not an accent grave, so it's tauta esten, these are, ta remata, the words, accusative plural of that word rema, these words, to hagiu, of the holy pneumatos spirit. These are the words of the holy spirit. All right, so let's move on then to the composition exercises. The first one that Machen gives us is by the will of God, we believed on the name of the Lord. So we'll took a light, take a look at what we have here. To thalemati to theu. This is the dative of means using this word thalema, will. So by the will of God, in the dative case, dative of means, by the will to theu of God, epistusamen, first person plural of the aorist of pistuo, we believed eis to onima, the neuter article with the neuter noun onima, eis to onima in the name, this is the accusative, notice that the accusative is the same form as the vocative, so eis to onima in the name to kiriu of the Lord. The second exercise, the rulers, so I have this word archon, this is the nominative plural, hoi, archontes, the accent remains where I found it because the short ultima, hoi archontes, the rulers, did not uk elaban, I use the second aorist of lambano, the third person plural ending, identical to the first person singular ending, the rulers did not receive uh, this hope, elpida is feminine, so tautain, tain, elpida, this the hope, literally, using a feminine demonstrative pronoun with the hope, elpida. Apo takes the genitive, to apostolu, from the apostle, comma, hoti, because uk epistusan, they did not believe, third person plural of the aorist, and so it's going to be, they did not believe, ace, tone, curion, in the Lord. Pretty straightforward. I hope you didn't have any trouble with that. Let's take a look at the third of these exercises. Number three reads, we shall know the will of God forever. You'll remember that gnosko has a deponent future, gnosomai. That's what we have here, but it's the first person plural, so it's going to be gnosomatha. We shall know ta, thelema, neuter, noun, we know that from the mu alpha ending, so it takes the neuter article, we shall know, ta, thelema, this is the accusative, but again, the accusative is identical to the nominative, we shall know, ta, thelema, the will, to theu, of God, eis, ton, iona, into the age, which idiomatically is rendered forever. We shall know the will of God 
forever. Well, I hope you found that that particular set of exercises wasn't too difficult. I think one of the most interesting paragraphs in this entire chapter, and if you don't mind me reading it, I like it because I think it's one of the most humorous chapters, and I wouldn't say that Machen is given to an awful lot of humor in this book, but if you look at paragraph 220, you'll notice this comment by Machen. He says, these two difficulties coupled with the difficulty of the dative plural make the third declension more difficult than the first or second. Otherwise, the declension is easy. So I hope you found that to be the case. Aside from the fact that it's difficult, it's easy. But uh, nevertheless, I don't think it's too difficult. And I think that as you work your way through these exercises, you'll find that it is, in fact, easy. And especially if you master the endings, be sure to get to the point that you feel fairly comfortable with the endings and can work through the exercises without great uh, uh, problems, then you'll be all set and ready for chapter 18, which will become one of the most important of our series of studies of New Testament Greek. Been great to have you back with us once again. Appreciate your uh, labors as you're going along with me in this uh, set of studies, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, God richly bless you. Thank you.